Okay, now we're going to hear about more big issues faced by women and refugees from two inspiring activists, both of whom you saw this morning. So short special session. Both of their countries, Ethiopia and Eritrea, have actually been in conflict since 1961. There's a moderate peace now, but the region still generates the huge numbers of refugees that you heard about this morning, as well as having a very significant gender gap. And we're going to be talking about the gender gap later on. So will you please welcome back L'Oreal spokeswoman, One Year World Councillor now, Leah Kabedi and Father Musi Sarai. I'm happy that we've been discussing it all day. And uh, actually this morning we had a, an interesting panel with all wonderful young delegates really talking about the importance of migration and immigration. And, um, you know, we're all immigrants. And um, what's going on right now in Europe is very sad. And um, the the way they're treated is very sad. And uh, I think we have to really look back at, you know, the humanity in us and, and really, un you know, try to understand why are these people fleeing? How bad can it be for them that they're going through all this to come to a place of safety and when they get there, uh, they're not given that safe, that safe passage. Um, I work a lot on maternal health. Yeah, I was going to say, and your own work within it. Do you work on maternal health with the migrants? Um, I do not, but um, it's, it's, not definitely, it. it's definitely um, a very uh, uh, you know, dangerous situation for young girls, young women, pregnant, who are quite fragile, um, crossing and, and borders and traveling and doing all these things. Uh, when they're already so fragile, I think they're so at risk. Um, it's a very and difficult place. In your work, so let's focus on that particular side of your work at the moment. And let's take a look at a video. So the context of your work as a World Health Organization ambassador for maternal health and the context of your foundation. We look at Leah's film. It's 3 a.m. in a remote village in Ethiopia. A woman named Kumi is in labor. The nearest clinic is hours away, and her only choice is to deliver the baby on the dirt floor. Even though I grew up in Ethiopia, and I knew giving birth here was dangerous, nothing prepared me for seeing it firsthand. It's literally pitch black in there. The thing is, every time a woman is delivering in a place like this, her chances of survival. I don't even know how you survive. <laughs> Not far from Kumi, a loving father named Alamu Amalo reads to his seven-year-old daughter, Amaraj. Just seven months ago, his wife hemorrhaged to death during childbirth. My wife was the love of my life, he said. Alamu now has to be both father and mother to his two little girls. He says he doesn't know what he's going to do. When a woman dies in childbirth, the whole family, the whole community feels the effect. And then there are the newborns. One in 32 babies in the developing world dies during the first month of life. <laughs> Dr. Mulu Alam Gassasa is a neonatologist in my hometown, Addis Ababa. She works seven days a week and sees thousands of babies a year. While giving a tour of the facility, she had to stop to resuscitate a baby girl, just 14 hours old. She was struggling to breathe. When asked the chances of the baby surviving, she held up her hand and said, zero. When you lose one, you cry. In spite of everything we are doing, it's not easy just to lose a life.
But there are glimmers of hope. The Ethiopian government and global partners have recently launched new programs to provide pregnant women with prenatal care and clean and safe delivery. Because of those efforts, a trained birth attendant arrived in time to help Kumi deliver a healthy baby girl. She named her Idile, which means lucky day. If these efforts can grow, my hope is that one day soon, a healthy childbirth in my country will no longer be considered a stroke of luck. But how can we help? Donate, donate, donate. <laughs> <laughs> Deal, okay? Got it. No, that's not true. <laughs> no. Um, actually, how the young people can help a lot is, um, is raise awareness. It's to raise awareness, it's to make noise, it's to talk about the issue. Um, it's social media, it's, uh, it's bringing it to the forefront, it's making sure that governments prioritize women's issues and mothers. Um, and then donate. <laughs> and it isn't prioritized, is it? It's not prioritized because, you know, dying in childbirth is something that's been going on forever. It's happened everywhere in the Western countries and the, you know, in the developing countries. But then as, to, you know, as co countries get richer and more developed, their infrastructure of health gets better, usually. Um, and, and then women have access to, because most of the women that you see that are dying here, they're not dying from things that are hard to prevent or are complicated. They're dying from things that are easily preventable, easily treatable, if only they can have access to basic medical care, have a trained, skilled attendant, a clinic, a doctor that's not far away. Um, a lot of the women die on the way to the hospital because by the time they decide there's something wrong with, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the ch with um, giving, with, with uh, the birthing uh, moment, um, it's already too late and then they try to get them to, there's no ambulance, there's no you know, cars, maybe there's no road, the closest hospital is really far away. Most women deliver at home. In Ethiopia, 80 to 90% of women still deliver at home. No clean water, no electricity. Um, mostly they're delivered by their mother-in-laws, or if they're lucky, there's a neighborhood midwife. Um, it's all of these things. So if there's any kind of complication, if there's a hemorrhage, or if the baby's too big, which most cases, you know, a lot of the women who are pregnant are young girls. So a lot of the times this yeah. happens. And these yeah. are all preventable conditions. And then suddenly you're left with a, a dead young woman, an orphan, or like we saw in the video, a father trying to raise his children and feeling lost, um, a village that's impacted, a community that's impacted. Um, so. Well, here you've got advocates, okay? Social media, so raising awareness, yeah? So who's going to do this? <laughs> Come on, hands up. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Go, okay? Promise? <laughs> Me too. Deal, okay? And we'll have to look at donations. We'll have to make a plan. Father Mercy, <laughs> we're all familiar with the headlines and the tragic stories, the migrants in the Mediterranean, lots of those tiny children, and several of these stick in my mind that examples in the mainstream media of women that have been found by the Italian Coast Guards in moments just before giving birth or with tiny, tiny babies. What about that situation? These, you know, to Leah's point, so fragile and so vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, the first we need, when we talk about migrants, when we talk about refugees uh, in generally, but the specific for women, first we need to put at the center our discussion that these people is human being. We are talking about human being with, our, with the same right, the same dignity, the same dream to live, to realize his dream, to have future in this world. The second point we need to discuss about how 
to prevent for these people to be obligated to come across the desert, the, across the Mediterranean Sea, to reach some peaceful area to have refuge, to rebuild his new life. In the discussion in this last months in Europe, not only in Europe, we discuss about how to <laughs> deport refugees, not how to protect refugees. Especially for the women, is really difficult. He faced a lot of problems because I, in these last 20 years, I hear many, a lot of his story from women who become kidnapped by the traffickers, he become torture, sexual violation, a lot of this kind of problems. Many of them he remain pregnant. We have a plan, we have a, a project in Israel, especially when I receive a distress call from the Sinai Desert in 2009, the first time, who called me? One woman, she's from Ethiopia, she's victim, she became kidnapped by these traffickers in Sinai Desert because she, she tried to cross the border between Sinai and Israel. Finally, she became, she remained pregnant because the traffickers are abused. Then she, she said to me, what can I do now? I am here in the desert. These people he asked me to pay the ransom $8,000. If, if I give birth here, the amount he become double because I need to pay for me and for the children. So we, we try to help this woman to pay the ransom to be free, and she go to Israel. In Israel, after that time, we organize a project to assist this kind of women, victims of the sexual abuse, and victims of the traffickers. So the point is, all the international community, he need to organize a project to protect these vulnerable people, especially women and children, to prevent for them this kind of suffer condition, suffer journey, to give them the chance to create safety place in the neighbor country. When these people escape from the origin country, he go to the neighbor, like we have around 70,000 refugees, Eritrean refugees in Ethiopia. I went two, two years ago. I see the, the same problem, women as he died during to give birth in this refugee camp. Because one of these refugee camps have more, around 14,000 refugees with one ambulance, no any medical presence in the camp. When this ambulance, he go to the hospital with that, with one person who need help, the others is totally abandoned. So when I, I go around in the refugees camp, I see a lot of tombs. I say, what, who, who is these people? He say me, most of these people, these women, he die during he give birth because no one is here to assist them. From that time, I put a project in Ethiopia. We start to give scholarship for the women, Eritrean women refugees in the camp to go to study in Ethiopia, nursing and obstetric, then to come back in the refugees camp to assist the others. Now I, we have this project to give this possibility for women to study, to give education, medical education, and to come back to assist the others. This is the way to help the women 
So really, where this comes together now with the two of you, one of the things, other than the fact that you come, both come from this, the same region and are doing such an incre incredibly brave work, where this comes together really is that you could say, I suppose, in the camps and among the, the, the refugees, the most vulnerable are going to be these women yeah. who are in the late stages of pregnancy and about to give birth. Would you say that, Leah? At any stage of pregnancy, I think you're vulnerable. vulnerable. But particularly, you can imagine on that uh, refugee, as you say, any, any time being pregnant. You see, what I know with One Young World, and I, I, know, I know this, I know this from, from all of you and from previous summits, is when people such as yourselves, who are really lights in a dark situation, when you shine a light on an issue like this for these young leaders, I know somewhere out here, there are a couple of young leaders who are going to take this as their issue and make a difference. So I think I just felt, we, we, we all felt knowing that the two of you were coming, that we were trying to get some, you know, pull, pull, pull this round and together. I mean, it's particularly, you know, this, how can we help female migrants? And from what you're saying, so if we looked at this and we said, okay, the most vulnerable would be these women in pregnancy. So that gives a focus on on Leah's, on Leah's issue, mm -hmm. and plainly something that you're facing all the time. I don't really want to take it on to broader issues of female migrants unless you want to, because you've mentioned sexual abuse now mm -hmm. and trafficking. Do you want to go into that now? Do you want to stay on? No, oh, it's still going. We have the same, in these days, one week ago, in the Sinai Desert, become killed 15% by the traffickers. We have people who are still kidnapped by the traffickers in Sudan. Are those, are those in the trafficking, my understanding, and I don't know enough about it. My understanding is that trafficking, is that mainly women? Yes, most. In this, I, in this last five years, I collect a lot of information in this issue. At least 70% of that the victims of human trafficking is women. We're going to talk about closing the gender gap later on, but plainly, plainly the gender gap is the, how can it be that it's, that it's, that it's just women? I mean, if you looked, if you looked at, at, at female, sorry, last question, question to you, Father Mercy. If you, if you looked at female migrants and you said, what are the things to do to help them? I mean, I'm putting the most vulnerable, the highest up, the women who are pregnant. And Lee is clear about that. We need, to, we need to be raising awareness on that. There's plainly an issue for medical assistance for these women in the camps, whatever that assistance is. I remember in London in 2010, um, Amara from Nigeria saying that she had a small linen bag. She's a nurse. A small little bag that she'd made, and she got one of the corporates, one of the businesses that were represented there, had given her wipes, sterile wipes, and she had a proper pair of scissors and a small pack of antibiotics. And she was distributing those to women in, um, outside Aruba so that they, they had some sort of chance of surviving infections, cutting a cord cleanly. So that was a, you know, a, a sort of a, a practical thing. But Leah, back to you. Returning to the number of maternal deaths. It's actually funny because yeah. I, um, speaking of things to take, um, I remember visiting one small um, clinic, uh, I think in, in Ethiopia, and one of the things that the women are asked to bring to, to the hospital when you are delivering was four different small shawl things so that they would use one for you, they would use one for the baby blanket, one for the, you know, when, they, when you're birthing and to, to, to take the baby. And then a fourth one for, I forget what it was, and they had to, this was the four things that, that were required of them to bring to the clinic to be able to deliver, and it's so, just... So little. It's just... So little. It's very, very sad. It's very, very difficult. It's so little when you think of four small pieces of cloth where in developed countries we throw away hundreds of tons of clothing a year. It's, a, it's rubbish, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's really, really is a bad thing. Um, 
Now, I think, are we have we, have we time to go to the floor? We have, haven't we? Am I going to the floor? We're rolling here? Okay. Um, let's see if the people that have put, have been, have sent in questions, if anybody would be ready. So, Olivia Robinson. Um, Tafan Akotaha from Sweden. Olivia Robinson. Yes, there you are. Oh, well done. Should we get Tafo up as well? Is that you, sweetheart? Oh, well done. And then let's have Putipath Tasnavites from Thailand. Putipath, are you there? Yes? Fantastic. Okay, let's go with those. So let's start off with you, Olivia. Hi, my name's Olivia Robinson. I'm from the UK. Um, among female refugees, um, people who are seeking asylum in, in different countries, there may be women who have not had the opportunity to have uh, an education or women who have not had the opportunity to have a job or develop certain skills um, or people that are seeking asylum in countries where their skills might not match the kinds of opportunities available there. I was wondering if you could provide some advice on how we could act to help these female refugees become economically empowered once they have been granted asylum in certain countries. Father? Um, yeah. I think here I discuss a lot of time with the uh, European Union to give uh, access in the in the integration process, the main important is education. To give the possibility to have high level education for these refugees or asylum seekers in the welcome country. Most of the time, the big problem is for many refugees, he don't have this, he don't allow this kind of access in the education system, in the new country. So the, the first step is this. Without education, it's not possible to, to, to get even good job in Europe or in, in a, any other country. So if we want help, we want empower these women, we need first to give them the access for education. I remember a couple of years ago um, when one of the delegates spoke about then refugees from Syria, which were not so many as they are today, and she urged delegates to, or all of us, to take up teaching the language. Yeah. You can't, you can't the first step. without the language. Um, will we go to Tafan yeah. from Sweden? Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, I think a lot of us who attended the summit last year uh, it doesn't go, didn't go unnoticed that a lot of the Yazidi women in Syria and Kurdistan were being sold as sex slaves and they were kidnapped and abducted. Um, They're still being sold as sex slaves. It's a market. And so my question is, uh, since a few have managed to flee and a few have managed to return to their homes, there's also a few who have, but very few, who have managed to make their way to Europe. Um, how can we create legal channels for these women to seek asylum? Should we prioritize? Is there any certain group you guys would prioritize when it comes to these questions? Father? Yeah. We are still in discuss with, especially, uh, I live in Europe, so most of my contact is with the European Union. We, we try to create this legal, channel with the resettlement program, especially for those vulnerable women with children, women victims of human trafficking, victims of this sexual abuse or other things. So with UNHCR, with another international organizations, we push to the European Union to create big resettlement program, especially for those really vulnerable case, especially for women. But we are waiting. And let's go to Putipat. There you are. Hello. <clears throat> so my name is Putipat. I'm a representative from Thailand. Right? So I understand and believe that all of us 
one young world delegate. We want the woman, uh, right for women, the abusive activity that's being done to them to stop. But my question is based on what can we do, right? Because right now there's a lot of, because we are, as an outsider, we heard a lot of countries that have been abusing women. There's a lot of women that are being raped or being murdered, and the perpetrator doesn't get any consequences. There's a countries where there are certain law that are, that strip away the right of women. And we, as an outsider, we are unable to intervene in those countries. So is there anything else that we can do apart from condemning those acts? Or is that the best that we can do already? Leah. Um, it's funny because this is, I think, the discussion that I had all day long today <laughs> with all the other counselors and delegates. And um, it's very frustrating, you know? It's very frustrating, I think, uh, being from the outside and seeing these um, injustice is being done um, to women all over. And um, I think already shining a light on the issue is a big step forward. Um, talking about the issue, um, not, not making it just, uh, I guess, a phase or a moment, because now all of a sudden there's all these, for example, refugees, so it becomes the subject of the moment, and then the next thing happens and then it gets forgotten. So it's about staying true to, if this is something that you, know, you believe in, it's to stay true and to push through until you, you feel like you've maybe made a dent. And I think every little dent helps. Um, at the end of the day, education, I think, is the key. Yeah. Um, everywhere and anywhere. Uh, and especially uh, girls' education, I think, is the key. And um, how we get that done worldwide is a difficult <laughs> question to answer, but uh, I think that's the way forward. Thank you, Pudji Pat. Do you want to go to that? I'll come back to Leah. All right, I, I can add something. The, the point is, one is education, the second is law to protect women, especially, especially we, men, we have big afraid of women. <laughs> women in power. It doesn't look like it, though. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yeah, so. <laughs> we need to change the mentality of men in our culture in different countries. We can change this only by education. Yeah. I guess, I guess summing that up, the problem is not women, it's men. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Leah, what, what's the biggest well, action? Well, I have a son and a daughter, so it's kind of <laughs> complicated. <laughs> <laughs> what have you found the biggest action that saves mothers' lives? I think what I wish, maybe we can talk about what I would wish. Um, what I would wish is there to be a sort of global fund for moms, I feel like would be, and I know this is a very big idea, but I think it's kind of, it's kind of, I think the World Bank is talking a little bit about it, and it's something that is probably doable, uh, but I feel like a global fund for mothers kind of a program would make a big difference. Um, saving women um, f uh, in this situation, it's not, easy because it's not a pill, it's not a one solution thing. So it's really hard for people to put their arms around it. We need, you know, serious health infrastructures, you need doctors, you need ambulances, you need, it's a, it's a lot of investment, it costs money. Um, and so one individual cannot really do it. Uh, we really need governments to prioritize and really invest in, in women. And in, this happens a lot in developing countries meaning a lot of developing countries need the funding to be, you know, to, to, to target this towards uh, just infrastructures and doctors and training midwives and skilled attendants and, and then also education of women. I mean, I, in some of the places that we worked in Ethiopia, I remember women 
feel like going to the hospital. They don't want to go to the hospital when they're pregnant because they feel like that's where women actually die. That's the concept they have in their minds because all they know is every time the woman goes to the hospital, she dies. But the, what they don't know is she's dying because she's getting there too late. Yeah. yeah. And so reversing that yeah. and having, you know, teaching them that no, actually when you get pregnant already, you have to be thinking, I need to go see, you know, a health care attendant or a, uh, a health extension worker and be followed. If and there is one. Yes, if there is one, uh, hopefully. Yes, that's also, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like a many pronged attack. solution yeah. attack. So we, you need a bigger um, movement. And so that's why for me, I feel like a global fund type of thing could be it's not a impossible. solution. It's not impossible. Not impossible. I know there are people here whose businesses are very well associated with the World Bank. <laughs> Job to do. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I hope that... You have to hang out with me all, all the time. The, <laughs> um, .org is... What's your .org? The Leah Kabede Foundation .org. Leah Kabede Foundation .org. .org. Okay, guys, got that, right? I know there was a lot of Twitter action this morning around, around, around your earlier session. So go for it. Leah wants awareness raised. Hit it. Okay? Everyone can we tweet salute. or post something. Thank you. You are heroes, truly heroes. Thank you for having us. Huge round of applause for Leah and Father Mussi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.